Hey, Restorative Family, uh, it's us back again here, part two, part two. Um, we're talking a little bit about uh, mast cell activation syndrome, uh, and we just wanted to talk to you because, like we were talking about before, everything that we're about is not fitting protocols. Like we've said, when you go to your doctor, how many times do they just say it's allergies, go take this medicine, go take that medicine. So let's expand on that a little bit right now with what are some of the triggers, what are some of the things to be able to make that determination, things that we will delve into rather than just going to see your family doctor about uh, a runny nose. Yeah, so we're talking about this secondary MCAS scenario. So there's almost always a triggering event or ongoing triggering events that are going to cause these mast cells to become overactivated and release these granules. So let's talk about some of these and there's a lot. So um, we think about food is a very significant piece of the puzzle. So you know if you have a food sensitivity that could be driving this. We also know that a lot of histamine heavy foods can also drive this MCAS scenario and symptom set. So even things like um, fermented foods, this could be wine. But these are healthy for you, fermented foods. Well, yeah. They? So, you know, even like your um, lacto-fermentation, like sauerkraut and kimchi, things like that. Yes. For some people, Maybe they are wonderfully important, but for this Somebody that might find themselves with mold illness or MCAS, that could actually be a significant driver of these symptoms. But also things that are cured, like cured meats and cheeses, things like that, they're also going to be higher in histamine and can kind of drive this response. Um, so we, we've talked a little bit about food. Um, there can be pathogens that drive this. You know, we are seeing huge numbers and I think increasing amounts of MCAS and just chronic illness in general. Um, I think a lot of this is driven by not only the food we're eating, the environmental toxins that we're exposed to, as well as some of these pathogens that we're exposed to. So mold illness is a really significant piece to this puzzle. We see um, people with chronic mold exposure and mold related illness um, kind of going hand in hand with this MCAS scenario. So we know that mold can drive this, but also things like various bacteria species that you might have, even an imbalance in the gut microbiome, um, viruses, parasites, and fungal infections within the body can also drive this. Um, it's interesting, you know, a lot of people with MCAS also notice that temperature changes can really um, exasperate their symptoms. So even the not only the seasonal changes with pollen, which obviously is a triggering event, but we also have these environmental factors of just the temperatures. So these people might experience rashes or swelling just if we're going from hot to cold or cold to hot. Um, so that's kind of a telltale sign or symptom as well. Hormone changes are really significant. We know that mast cells have a, a really interesting interplay with sex hormones. So um, especially with females who are going through a monthly cycle and monthly hormone rhythms and shifts, they might notice um, symptoms rise and fall with hormone um, cascades. We also know that environmental toxins, so things like Roundup and glyphosate that are ubiquitous in our environment can trigger this. Um, adjuvants and vaccinations have um, some heavy metals in them. You know, heavy metals, aside from vaccines, can also drive this. So we need to be scrutinizing what environment, environmental exposures might be driving this response as well. Yeah. You know, if I'm missing any other triggers, no, I mean, there's no, a lot of them. There's, there's a lot of triggers, and almost if that, that's the challenge with MCAS is that almost anything can be triggering it and driving it. And so if we're seeing that be happening, one of the challenges with it is, is that mast cells, there's, we know of over 200, and a lot of docs like Dr. Lawrence Afrin and some of the people that are working on his team know that there's, are suspicious that there's actually over 400 different chemical mediators that may be a part of what is released from mast cells. So how on earth do we begin to test this? One of the things is if somebody is in a flare, that can be a time where it is the best opportunity to maybe be able to find and diagnose 
some of these things. We might look at serum histamine levels, serum tryptase levels, chromogranin A, various leukotrienes, or other inflammatory cytokines, I can say that, prostaglandin D2. You know, these are some different chemicals that we can start to look for in the blood to begin to understand what's going on in a period of a flare is where we're going to be most likely to find and catch some of these, some of these chemicals, okay? From a holistic, natural, functional medicine standpoint, how might we go about doing this? It's all about trying to stabilize mast cells. And so various uh, anti-inflammatories, whether it be turmeric or resveratrol, can be helpful supporting proper methylation function through various B vitamins, if appropriate. Uh, SAM-E can be really beneficial, potentially. One of the other things to uh, potentially be doing within that it would be things like quercetin. An enzyme called DAO or diamine oxidase can be really helpful for supporting proper histamine levels within the body. And I keep saying histamine, not all MCAS is histamine driven, but it's a big one, okay? Um, and acetylcysteine, vitamin C, glutathione, guess what I just named off? A number of constituents that we are utilizing in IV nutrition. So for somebody who is dealing with MCAS, IV nutrition may be an incredibly beneficial thing to support methylation, to support the proper nutrient balances to stabilize mast cells. Yeah, I mean, it, it can go on and on and on yeah. as we're talking Where do about, we end? and that's actually what the whole point is. And that's why, even as Dr. Ashley said, it's something that doesn't have to be just a single type episode. These are episodic, these are things that continue on. Unfortunately, even sometimes. Uh, underlying cancers can set up for this type of a situation too. So it's important to be able to differentiate those things and, yeah. and that's where these, these blood tests can, can be of some huge benefit. When you talk about treatments, okay, uh, Dr. Kevin talked about some of the easiest and more natural ways to do it. You know, you want to break down those enzymes, you want to demethylate things, you want to get rid of this stuff, etc. You also want to try to avoid things, obviously. So the, yeah, the that was number one. prevention, <laughs> yeah, prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? Okay. Yeah. So let, let's think about that kind of stuff. But so from from an allopathic world, you know, how many times have you gone and somebody said they've got allergies and they go and they tell you go take some Benadryl because it's over the counter, you can go buy it anywhere. I used to have a real problem with that because way back when, when you would get Benadryl, it almost always had was, was made with red dye. So it's like, okay, now you're adding yet another trigger into this whole process, which is silly. They've since learned their lesson and taken the dye out of it. But there are, are any histamines out there that are able to cross the blood-brain barrier to make you very tired if that's something that's going to benefit you like Benadryl, etc. And there's also some of them that don't cross the blood-brain barrier, like your Allegra's or Fexafenidine and your Claritin, which is called Loratadine, that you can also buy over the counter. And there's actually a whole bunch of them now that, that are out there on the market. But that's just what they are. They are just purely antihistamines blocking the H1 receptor inside the body. So again, as we talked about, there are so many other enzymes that get, that get um, released from the mast cells that you're only talking about partial treatment with things. Sometimes we will actually will also use H1 and H2 uh, blockers, uh, especially when you have gastrointestinal symptoms. Cimetidine, which used to be called tagamet, was a classic one. So it could actually help people that had urticaria, the rash, as well as some of those other peripheral symptoms. Um, so you talk about those antihistamine groups, then you've got the mast cell stabilizers out there. Now, they thought these things would be great. There's one in particular called chromalin that, that you can get. The problem with chromalin is it has a very short half-life. And since you're getting repetitive exposure, you almost always have to take uh, chromalin like four times a day. And let's be honest, who's going to take something four times a day? I mean, it's hard enough to eat three times a day, let alone take a medicine four times a day, okay? So chromalin and sodium was something out there. And it is still available for some of the more difficult cases, okay? And then there's actually the anti-leukotriene medicines. There's a big one that came out not too long ago, monolucast, or Singular. So a lot of times you would hear people taking Singular for their allergies because it actually also helped to stabilize, like Dr. Kevin said, 
that Luca train cascade and, and so the, that will then start developing vasodilatation and all the other symptoms that are actually the end product with everything too. And then finally, there's, a, there's an investigational drug, something that we use more for asthma, especially eosinophilic asthma, something called Zolaire, okay? And most of the times that's been confined to, you know, your research institutes, etc. But that looks like it's going to be very, very promising because it's actually something you have to use much less frequently. Mm -hmm. So that's other things down the road. But again, you know, the natural products, the IV therapies, and especially prevention is going to be always the things that you're trying to look out for more than anything, too. Yeah. You want to talk about LDN? Oh, yeah, and of course LDN. How, how could I forget, right? <laughs> okay. Um, we always talk about low-dose naltrexone and all the benefits that it does. And one of the big things is, as you've been on it for a little while, it works on those toll gate receptors. And those toll gate receptors are the things that have a lot to do with immune function, autoimmunity, and helping to, to balance that inside your system. And like we talked about as triggers, there is a lot of autoimmunity type things, um, lupus variations, etc., that will also be triggers for mast cell de degranulation as well, too. I think it's important to understand, you know, all of us work together to kind of get to the root cause right. of what these yeah. symptoms are. And one thing we forgot to really talk about was, you know, we talk about these triggering events, you know, if there is mold illness or a fungal infection or a, some other environmental exposure, we need to remove that and get to the bottom of that yeah. before we're really going to see a lot of um, relief from these mast cell um, symptoms, but also, you know, that these other compounds that we're talking about are even going to work. But we also, you know, when we are considering root cause, you know, I'm certified in functional genomics, so I really get yeah. geeky about the, the variants genetically that yeah. people might have. So we've talked about, you know, diamine oxidase, the DAO and the HNMT and some of these other receptors that we might have variants in that could predispose somebody to having a hard time not only with histamine, but also with um, mast cells being stable. So, you know, looking, you know, if you are one of those people, we can definitely, like, take a peek at genetics and then be able to support that specific pathway. Um, but it's also, every time I talk about genetics, we also need to know that that's not the end-all, be-all either. We know that um, the genetics load the gun and the environmental factors load the trigger. And I, oh, trigger. Pull the trigger. Pull the trigger. I got you. <laughs> so, um, you know, we are living in an increasingly toxic and stressed out world. Hmm. We did not mention, but stress is probably <laughs> the number one triggering event for mast cells. So we need to understand that stress is a big deal as well. Yeah. So. The root of all evil. <laughs> Everybody's stressed these days. We all know it, yeah. okay? But tons of factors that can trigger it. Tons of things that can be looked at to delve deeper, understand if this may be the underlying Oakham's razor to your health history or that loved one that you might know and lots of different things that we can do from not only a natural but even a pharmacological intervention to support, stabilize, and help decrease symptomatology throughout it. So It's not in your head? Nope. Yeah. You're not crazy. You're not crazy and there's probably <laughs> answers for you. Yeah. All right. Hope you have a great rest of the day, everybody. Enjoy. Enjoy spring.